Well, welcome to another RD Works Learning Lab. Um, I'm going to be working up there in that top apartment block for the next week and a half. It's like a prison. But hey, you shouldn't feel too sorry for me because I think from the sound, uh, you'll see there's going to be a little bit of downtime. Yeah, it's not a bad place to work. Well, I say work, but to be honest, I'm here just uh, enjoying helping a guy debug some machines that he's importing from China. And, uh, well, I don't think I could be doing it in a better place, do you? Now, I don't really feel any sympathy or pity for me. I'm working on a holiday. I'm here in lovely Florida, and you can see the sea just outside the workshop. This is the performing dog. <laughs> right? And this is Danny Martinez. And he is the guy that I'm helping because he's trying to make sense of these machines. Now I have to say they're not bad machines as they come through the door, but Danny's in the process of trying to make them from 98% to 102% perfect. So we're making a pin table, and he's anticipating supplying all sorts of goodies with this machine. Right, we've just made these little pieces which are out of uh, 1.8 or 2 millimeter acrylic, and they just plug together like that. We then bring our pin table into view and that hopefully is going to be a nice snug fit in that hole there like that that will now locate in there. We've arranged these pin holes so that they miss the holes in the table. Let me just stop for a minute and look out the window. That's better. <laughs> you know, one of the first problems we had to deal with the fact that this machine, although it was designed as a 60 watt machine, has got a 100 watt tube in it. And down here we had a bore which was only 9 millimetres diameter. Well, basically it meant that <laughs> the, the beam didn't fit down there because the beam was about 10 or 11 millimetres diameter. So this is the first thing that we had to do, was just modify that bore down there. And the second thing we had to do was to modify the head here to make it, we've got this temporary plate on here at the moment, which is, a, um, which is an adjustable plate that allows the head to move in, out and up and down. So the place is mayhem at the moment because everybody's arriving for a stag night, or in a hen night as well. This was the exhaust duct as we found it. It had a four inch, well it's about a 54 millimetre diameter bore in there. Absolutely useless. So we've had to rip it out, as you can see. And this is a four inch duct which was there. Then we've um, had to machine out the back here in a fairly crude manner. But we punched a hole in the back there and we've put a four inch duct in here now. Now we've managed to get my um, acrylic tube mount system in here and the mirror is mounted solidly on the end so we've got a one piece tube and mirror mount and that seems to work extremely well. Well this is a sunrise from the balcony and today I'm very excited because later on we're going to be receiving a visit from a guy that I've been conversing with over the internet for probably about 18 months now. Now I've been worried for quite some time about the destructive powers um, of this high frequency impact engraving the effect that it might have on the life of our tube and hopefully this guy will start examining this machine that we've got here and taking a look at exactly what's going on so we can establish whether or not high frequency impact engraving is a destructive force or whether it's just a force for good that we can exploit. Okay, I'm Chip Williams and I'm an electrical guy and I'm glad to meet uh, Russ, uh, like a, there he is, like a, like a lot of other folks, I bought uh, one of the Chinese uh, laser machines 
it didn't work when I got here and I went out on the internet hunting for solutions and found Russ and uh, so it's good to get to meet him in person. Uh, also I uh, want to thank uh, Danny Martinez for hosting us uh, down here which uh, is awesome. Uh, one of the things that I would like to do uh, is to share a little bit about some of the electrical fundamentals that go into uh, our laser machines and in particular I want to talk about the, the laser subsystem. I'm going to leave all the servos and all that stuff alone for a second. But would like to talk about the laser subsystem which basically consists of the laser tube and the power supply. That's, that's really uh, what we have there. I've got an image here that uh, basically done by Ian Tresman. I'm attributing him as I should. Uh, that is a picture of an electric uh, gas discharge tube. So Russ has already had a, a, a very good uh, lesson on Artie Works Learning Lab on the basic uh, molecular uh, actions that are going on with the CO2 inside of a laser tube to, to make it laze uh, on that. So we're not going to get into that, uh, but the challenge that we have is somehow or another getting the energy into the gas so that we can then make it laze. And there's several ways to do that. If we look at somebody like Sinrad, they're using RF energy to, to make it laze. But on most of our Chinese machines, and in fact most of uh, these less expensive machines, we use a DC excited tube. The laser tube is not any different than any other gas discharge tube. It's the same as your fluorescent light in your house. It's the same as the neon lights that you see uh, up on buildings. It's the same as a xenon light that's in a flash strobe. Uh, and uh, gas discharge has some very unique characteristics and it, in fact is uh, not a very uh, good load. The bottom scale on this is logarithmic uh, and that gives us some expansion where we can see what's going on. Uh, you're going from like 10 to the minus 10th amps uh, up to 10,000 amps across the horizontal axis and then we have linear voltage up on the left axis and this gives us a picture of what a, a, a generic gas discharge tube is going to do. This is going to be unique with any kind of, of gas discharge tube and in fact even in the lasers between tubes of the same model, certainly between different tubes, these are all going to, 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 to be a little bit different uh, on there and it has to do with what gas you have in there, what the mixture of the gas is, what the temperature is, what the pressure of the gas is, how old the gas is, if we, if we started to break it down, and all of these uh, characteristics can change a little bit. When we start to try to bring up the tube, uh, we're down at the bottom left corner uh, of the graph down there. We have no voltage uh, uh, on it. We don't have any current going through it. Uh, but the minute that we start applying voltage to it, we actually start getting some current right from the very beginning because there's cosmic radiation, there's uh, you know, trace amounts of radioactive elements, all, all this inside the tube that, that's going to, to ionize essentially single electrons out there. And so you start getting some little bit amount of current. And as we increase the voltage, on this, we then get into uh, what's called the, uh, the, the the Townsend discharge or the Townsend regime. You occasionally get an electron loose, and it's able to go and it's knock other electrons loose. Now, this has nothing to do with lasing; it just has to do with the gas. If you've ever seen a fluorescent light where the the, the end of the light is glowing, but the whole the whole bulb's not on, you're looking at some of that Townsend discharge where the, the electrons get loose, they bump into some more electrons, and so you get a little local uh, uh, region of glow. Then as you keep increasing the voltage, you start to, 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 to get a, a corona effect down in there. And this may very well be 
the region, Russ, that you have interest in with respect to ionization. This is the, this is the pre-ionization region that we're talking about. And that's the case where we start having electrons that are making their way from end to end on the tube, but there's not enough current density to keep the whole thing going. And so we start getting uh, these little spikes of, uh, uh, of lasing action out, but it's not, uh, it's not a continuous beam at that point. And we may well be in that region when we're talking about pre-ionization. And as we further get up, uh, we, we all of a sudden get to a point where it breaks down and the tube is in an area of constant current conduction. And that's what, uh, in a gas discharge tube, we would, we would call the normal glow region. But this is basically the area where everything is running solid. We would, where do we see about 15% setting on our, our uh, machines? We start seeing where we just have regular solid power out there. And that's probably about here where this is, is, is breaking down. And when we do that, if we increase the current anymore, the voltage actually comes back down. And it goes to a section in this normal glow where the voltage is constant across the tube. And that's going to have to do again with the physical characteristics of the tube and such, but you're going to have a fixed voltage per inch or per meter of the tube, uh, and it's going to stay in that area that's, uh, that's in this normal glow region. And this normal glow region on our tubes is probably in the milliamp to, let's say, the 22 milliamp or maybe more on the bigger tubes. But, you know, there's definitely this region that, that, that's the normal region. And in this area, the current is putting energy into that gas and then it's coming out in different ways. If it's, if it's on a regular neon light, you're getting photons out that's, that's uh, uh, making light. If you put it in a fluorescent uh, light, it's making ultraviolet that does, that's then hitting the fluorescent coating and making light that away. Uh, in the laser, uh, it's working with all these molecules to go through the steps that result uh, in us getting lasing uh, out the other end. And that works uh, across uh, this whole range that's normal. Then we start getting what they would call an abnormal glow. And at that point, we've really kind of loaded up the molecules with all the energy that they really want to take. And then we're trying to push more in there. And uh, to a certain extent, you'll still get more power out. You, if it's a light of some kind, you'll still get more light out. But, but ugly things happen too. Uh, and in the case of our lasers, we start having the CO2 dissociating more into carbon monoxide. We start having our uh, cathodes and our anodes getting contaminated. Uh, these things happen in this abnormal glow. And if you keep pushing it and pushing it, eventually what happens is it'll arc over inside. And the most common example of that is actually a lightning bolt, right? I mean, you get a lightning bolt from the ground uh, to, uh, to the sky or vice versa. And what happens there is uh, your currents uh, go uh, up you know, to extreme amounts, uh, you know, maybe hundreds of amps or thousands of amps. So we're way beyond our you know, 10, milli, you know, 10 to 20 milliamp kind of region uh, in there on that. So in our normal use, we're going to be staying in that normal glow range. That's where we want to stay. And uh, we might find some use down at the low end of that region. I know we've been experimenting with engraving, trying to work in that pre-ionized region uh, in there on that. One last interesting thing here is that if you are illuminating the tube, and you're extinguishing the tube, turn it on and off, you'll notice it doesn't follow the same path. And one of the things that we can see is it may take more current to get it going, and once it's going, you can actually go back down to a lower current before it extinguishes itself. And uh, I'm pretty sure that I've seen that myself, but this is also <laughs> something that may help with the, uh, the engraving 
where we're seeing uh, things turn on and off and we're getting this sort of more of a, a random pattern in there. Uh, another thing to, to notice about this is that this doesn't necessarily happen instantly. It, it takes some time to, to move through this dark discharge area to get into the glow region down there. It, it, it's not an instant thing. The, the gases are having to absorb energy and, and, and move through this. But once we're in this normal glow region and that voltage is constant, we can very, very quickly change the currents in there when we're actually etching or doing the um, uh, doing the bitmap images, the grayscales, where you would have to be changing the values very quickly, you can do that in that normal region. And that's why on some uh, things like the uh, SINRAD on the RF, for instance, and I've seen some other references, uh, s some lasers, the higher end, actually have pre-ionization power supplies. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to hold you right there. Not enough laser power to come out to, to, to actually do anything, but right there so that you can move then very quickly through there. Uh, they certainly, SINRAD does that on their RF lasers uh, on that. Probably not something you're gonna see on these uh, DC lasers that we have. One of the things that we were looking at in the uh, graph on the tube was that it, it had a section where the voltage dropped back down as the current increased. That's actually a region of negative resistance. And that is an absolutely unstable operating position. It will not stay in that position. And so you have to take some steps in your power supply to make it into a stable uh, condition. And in the electrical world, people might call that a ballast. And the simplest, the simplest way to do that is with a resistor. In fact, if you'll go out to some of the homebrew laser uh, pages online, you'll actually see where somebody uses uh, just a basic constant voltage power supply and a resistor to drive the laser, as opposed to our, our switching power supply uh, power supplies that come in, in, in our machine. If you were to just hook a straight constant voltage supply to the laser and the voltage was high enough that it was going to fire and you didn't do something to drop that voltage back down as that current goes up, it would rip right through there up into that arcing area and you would probably damage something significantly. So the simplest ballast is, is a straight resistor. And what happens here is the voltage goes up, there's no current here to speak of, it's down in the nano amps, whatever, going through that region. So there's no current through here, there's no voltage drop across the resistor. Ohm's law, voltage equals current times resistance. If the current's nothing, the voltage is nothing. And so it means the the, the voltage directly gets across the laser tube, it fires the laser tube. Once the laser starts conducting and there's current through there, then you get a voltage drop across the resistor, which means that you have a lower voltage on the laser tube, and if you size the resistor appropriately, then you can make it so that when you're at that constant voltage it wants to be at, that you have the right amount of current going through that resistor and you can, you can do this to, to make uh, a very simple power supply. This is a very, very simple way to do it. So you ask the question, well, why don't we just all use resistors on here? And the answer is, is it's very, very inefficient, right? This, this power supply voltage may uh, go up to 35 kV uh, to be able to fire these tubes under all the conditions reliably down there, but yet when you're uh, running this in a steady state, maybe that voltage is 15 kV or 17 kV, something like that. Uh, so it's dropped down from there. When I do that, that means I've got to actually drop the voltage from like the 35 kV to the 15 kV. I've got 20 kV. I've got to drop across that resistor. And you know what's going to happen with it? It all turns to heat. Yeah. It all turns to heat. So that means, uh, it's, that's not a little resistor, that ends up being a big resistor. Okay, not only that, the power supply itself has got to have enough power 
to be able to not only run the laser, but to heat up the resistor. So it's a very, very inefficient setup. And so even though it's very simple, it's super inefficient. And these days, given what power costs, uh, nobody uh, wants to do that. But uh, it, it does illustrate uh, the idea that uh, you do have to have some sort of mechanism to make that voltage drop once the laser fires. Now, one other thing when we, when we talk about the, the power supplies is that the, the power, the voltage, when there's no current, has got to be high enough to fire that tube. It has got to be above what was that peak voltage on that graph that we were looking at. It, it has to be high enough to do that. Uh, if, the, if you have a problem, we talk about debugging our power supplies here, if some, there's something the matter with the power supply and the voltage doesn't go high enough, the laser's not going to fire. You'll never see anything with the laser. Even if the laser tube is brand new, perfectly good, you know, nothing's going to happen. Likewise, we were talking about the shape of that curve. While the shape stays the same, the actual points change. And so as the tube gets older, uh, if the gas is starting to disassociate a little bit, if you're cooler or warmer temperatures, uh, all these things can make those set points change. So in the case of my tube that I got where it had broken and the water was out there, you want to you want to know where the voltage would have been on that. It would probably have been 100 kV to make something go through that tube with all that water in there. The point, the point is, is it's also possible that you have a problem with your tube. That causes the voltage that you need to fire that tube to go up higher than what the power supply can go out. So you can have a perfectly good power supply, it's putting up, goes as high as it could go, 35 kV, let's say, but that's not high enough to fire the laser off. Since a simple resistor is very inefficient, uh, one of the things that people want to do is have, first of all, efficient power supplies. But we've got some other things that we need to do as well. We need to, we need to protect ourselves from getting shocked by what's on the power mains. We need to have some sort of realistic control uh, of our current in that normal glow range. Uh, the power supply itself needs to have uh, some kinds of protection in case something happens that it won't burn itself up. And so we have these, these power supplies uh, in our machines. And, and, and really, this is something that uh, probably has come out of the PC market. They, those, those have gotten really inexpensive and so they're easy to do. So first thing that we're thinking about is that we've got to have the really high voltage. So if we're coming in with the power mains and okay 110 volt in the US, 220 in UK, uh, but we need to be 35k volts, the first thing that comes to our mind is a transformer. Okay and an ideal transformer uh, basically whatever in instantaneously in time, whatever power is going in is coming out. You don't want any energy stored in the transformer itself. So like the transformer that you have that provides power to your house, for instance, it's made with a, 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 a core that's made up of, of steel laminate and it does not store any energy. What comes in goes out. Uh, and that would, would be fine, I suppose, if you wanted the, the constant voltage supply, but we don't want that. So the alternative is to actually have a transformer that stores energy and delivers it in a metered way. And that's the magic of our power supplies is that transformer right there. That transformer stores energy. It's not made out of laminates of steel. It's made out of some kind of ferrite material. Maybe it has an air gap in it. It's not continuous all the way around. And so it can store energy inside that transformer. And now, you know, everybody's probably, gla eyes are glazing over on me, but the most common transformer of this type is a spark coil that's in your car. That's exactly what it does. And if you remember, uh, before the electronic ignition, you had a set of points, right, in the car. And when you, when the points closed, right, the, you got energy started building up in that coil. And when the points opened, the energy's got to go somewhere. 
And, and so the coil starts looking for places to dump the energy. And where it ends up dumping the energy is across the, your spark plug. And that's how you get the spark on that. So that's a case of where you're storing the energy uh, that's, a, that's in a coil. And that's the kind of transformer that we have inside of our, uh, inside of our power supplies that are down there. So um, at the risk of causing some more grief, this, this gets treated uh, it's electrically, as electronics that's called an inductor. But what happens is, is when you turn on the switch, and this is electrical equivalent of those points that you had in your car, and you put a voltage across that coil, the, the current inside the coil starts, starts ramping up. And as it ramps up, it ramps up higher and higher and higher, it eventually gets to a point where that transformer can't hold any more energy. It just, it's holding all the magnetic energy that it can. And it, if that happens, this current just actually takes off through the roof. And that point's called saturation. And, uh, and you don't want to go there because as the current goes up, you're either going to burn up your coil, you're going to burn up your transistor, something happens. The, the generally, the control mechanism inside the, the power supply will take that from happening. If you remember back on the, the, your coils, some of your uh, cars, I had a, an MG Midget, it actually had a separate little resistor that was bolted on the outside of the coil that would keep that current from going over too high. And some of those coils actually had resistance built into them to keep this from going up over. We can control how long we leave the, the voltage applied to that with pulse width modulation. And that can determine whether we have this much current before we shut off or this much current before we shut off. And so that allows us to adjust the amount of power that we get. And what it does is it puts that much energy in here. When you put the energy in here, when you turn it off, it's gonna go somewhere. It's gotta go somewhere. That, that magnetic field starts collapsing, it's got to go somewhere. And what's set up is it's set up with this secondary coil to come out and go through your laser tube. We have a, a control mechanism to control this switch into this transformer. And this is probably happening somewhere around 100,000 times a second. It's like 100 kilohertz, maybe 150 kilohertz. This is a very design dependent, okay? My power supply is not necessarily gonna be the same as your power supply on that uh, frequency. It, in general, as the frequency go up, your transformer can physically be smaller, but you start having more losses and this will get hotter. And so it's a trade-off, it's an engineering trade-off that, that's in there, but 100 kilohertz to 150 kilohertz, those are the kinds of range that these things work with today. And so basically, this control mechanism uh, on this is, is, is trying to keep you essentially uh, in, 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 in this range right here uh, on there. Now, what that translates into is that every 100 kilohertz, you're going to get a fixed amount of energy, joules of energy, dumped off to go into the laser tube, okay? And so many, so many joules uh, energy over that 10 microseconds of time is going to be so many watts of power. That's, that's what's going to happen on that. And then remember if we're, uh, and so that, those watts of power can translate in different ways. That's watts of power drained from the power supply, not watts of power coming out of the tube is laser energy. This no, is completely it's separate not. Thing. This is, uh, again, we've already, Russ has already done a great job talking about the power coming out. We're just talking about how we're getting energy into this tube, okay? And what happens here is that before the tube's fired, and I can't get any current through that tube, we know that power equals voltage times current. Power is voltage times current. And so if my current is very low, almost zero, that voltage is gonna be very high for that amount of power, and that's how we get our 35 kW or kV that we use to fire it. Once this drops down to a lower voltage, okay, now I've got a lower voltage, I've actually got current going through here. Now my power voltage times current 
okay, then for that given voltage, I'm going to have a certain amount of current in there, and, that, and that's going to be in that glow region that we're using. So uh, this, this, this transformer, is, it's a magical thing. It's very much uh, the, the central part of this power supply. So even in the steady state glow region, you've still got 100, 125, 150K frequency being pushed through the tube. So it's not an absolutely steady uh, power output that we're likely to see. It's the, the power in is still a high frequency power. That, that's, that's, that's true. There are some things you can do that can make it more steady. You can actually have a, uh, a slight amount of capacitance uh, on the output, which basically then the the current's getting dumped into the capacitor, which is then getting dumped into here. And so it, it'll actually smooth it out so that you do have a more steady state. That could be also a design consideration. I can't say that's there. Now, if, of course, if you've got too much capacitance, that slows down your response, right? And so you're not likely to, to, to want to do that. Now, what happens is that when the current's flowing through the tube, we tend to think this is our anode. Okay, this is our cathode, and we tend to think of that as being grounded, the cathode being grounded, but it's not truly grounded. Okay, it actually goes through a very small sampling resistor inside, and that sampling resistor is used to determine what the current is. Okay, so you've got some little resistor down here, and the voltage current times resistance is going to give you some little voltage. Right, so let's say uh, for Grins that we uh, are using the analog power setting method that basically goes from 0 to 5 volts okay uh, uh, on our power supplies and then we wanted to have um, let's say at uh, uh, you know at 20 milliamps you're going to get 5 volts right there and so then inside the power supply there's basically uh, 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 comparator or a difference operator and it's going to tell you the difference between what you'd like it to be and what you actually are and you get out something that's usually called little e for error it's the error voltage of where you are right am i asking for more than it's giving me or is it giving me more than what it's uh, asking for and that gets fed into the control okay to adjust this up or down to provide more or less energy okay to, to get your tube and so you basically you've got uh, a closed loop here so we've already said we could have 100 or 150 kilohertz but this is um, and I don't know Russ if you've ever worked with servos uh, I mean real uh, servos and the, the it's, a, it's a electrical equivalent of the same thing as a mechanical servo but w what happens is is that loop itself has got a frequency and a, and a response, a response time, a damping. So, for instance, if you uh, if you put in a step function, okay, you you're, you're at one setting and you want to go to another setting, and I don't care whether the one setting is zero and you want to go to 20 milliamps or whether it's from 10 to 15 milliamps. You just but you're you're making a jump right there, then uh, what happens then is you, you're, you're, um, if I were to plot error over time, uh, if, if where I want to get to is here, then several things can happen. Depending on my design, okay, if I, you know, I might say, I don't ever want to go over my current that I'm doing. You know, I'm, I don't ever want to go over. Okay, I'm going to be conservative and not go over. Then, then, uh, then I'm going to start trying to get up to my setting. And you know what? I better not overshoot. And so I, I, I come up and I do like that. Or I might be like really, really conservative. I really, really don't want to do it. I'm really going to be cautious like that. And I might say, oh well, you know what? Let's let's take it real easy and let's go like that. Or somebody may do their design and they may say, you know what? Said, I'm willing to overshoot just a little bit, but I want to get up to my current just as fast as I can. 
okay, and then settle out. So I might have a response that comes up and goes over and then comes back down like that, okay? And, um, and probably uh, this one and this one are the two common, most common types of control loop designs there. Now, if you go too hard, if you go too hard, uh, the other thing that can happen is that I overshoot real quick and I don't make it and I end up, I end up being unstable coming back. And I bring that up because I think that's what you're seeing when you were talking about your scope and you were talking, you're thinking in your ionization. I think that's one of the things that, that, that you're seeing that, that's down there. And the interesting thing about this is this frequency is determined by the design of this loop. It has nothing to do with the 100 kilohertz that's driving this. It has nothing to do with the 50 or 60 hertz that's in your mains. It has nothing to do with your PWM frequency that the controller is doing. It's a whole nother frequency that we have to worry about that, that, that's in there. So um, we can, you know, we can look at this. This is this is this is very difficult uh, design, you know, way beyond uh, what we need to do to get into the math of that. But it it's important uh, to understand that that's done by design, and it's also important that, to know that uh, let's say that we have a uh, let's say that we do our response such that. We want to get there quick. We're willing to overshoot just a little bit, but we're uh, we want to settle back down the first time, like that. It's important to note that response right there will be the same. If that picture will look the same shape, regardless of whether you're going from zero to twenty, ten to twenty, if it's between any two values, it'll have that same shape. But the, the engineers that do this stuff, they're they're magicians. Okay. Um, the transformers, which are the center, the Chinese are actually very good at this. They are very good at doing the magnet. We call it the magnetics. They're, they're good at that. That's sort of what's in our power supplies. Now, Russ, you, you asked about using the power supplies with, uh, uh, with, with different size tubes on that. Uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you uh, some things. Uh, this, this power supply is only going to be able to provide so much energy and that's going to be by virtue of the really the size of that transformer right I've got that transformer and it's made out of ferrite material and it's got so many cubic centimeters of that material it holds this much energy period right so I can't I can't really ask it for for more beyond that because I, I can't get that out and that's one of the ways it protects itself uh, from, from, from getting done. And so I, I definitely, I, I might put a bigger tube on there if, if uh, when we first fire it off, if the voltage gets high enough that it'll actually fire the tube, go ahead, put your 60, put your 60 watt power supply on your 100 watt tube. It's not, it's not gonna hurt anything, but if it's too long and it doesn't make a high enough voltage to fire, well then it's just not gonna fire. Right, but but once if it does make it enough to fire, it's not going to hurt the power supply. It'll just it'll deliver that much power through the tube. This whole design is basically a, a, a current loop, so it doesn't care if one tube settles out at 15,000 volts and another one settles out at 12,000 and another one settles out at 17,000. It doesn't care about that. It's not going to care about that at all. So that's an okay that's an okay thing to do. Um, putting a uh, 100 watt power supply on a 40 watt tube. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's going to trigger. It's going to make the tube fire on there. But now at that point, you can deliver a whole bunch more power into that tube and current than that tube can really handle. If you keep it down at the low end of things, it's probably going to work. If you if you decide you're going to push it, well, you're going to burn your tube up pretty pretty quick on that. So it's, um, it's best, I think it's best to match the tube with, with the power because uh, the guys uh, that are doing the design know what for a typical 
tube of let's say 60 watts, they know what the voltage is likely to be to fire and they know what kind of current range they're looking for. And so they've done this design to have the operating sweet spot right where your tube's going to be. Brilliant. Thanks, Jeff. That clears up lots of questions that people have asked me. What, what I wanted to show you there, uh, Russ, is, is you can see the response to the... the uh, yeah, blow the overshoot up. and then the steady current or steady right. voltage. It over, you know, it, it, it overshot a little bit. Uh, in this particular case, it went back down below a little bit yeah, and yeah. then it creeped up. Okay, that's um. Uh, but that's then you've still got your hundred kilohertz floating still, in between there, presumably. That's what that is, is it? That was twelve uh, little pulses in there. So that I, I, I counted that. Okay, that's one hundred and twenty. That's one hundred and twenty hertz. Which is now, the rectified veins. Now where do now where do you yeah so so in the in the power supply over there you have to take the mains which is AC yeah you have to rectify yeah. that they just give you a DC and, and they don't bother to put a capacitor or anything across well the no they put a capacitor but it's not necessarily a it's great capacitor right it's not all that uh, it's not all that smooth we were talking about what happens when the when you fire it off and how things are adjusting. And what's the what's your peaks? What are those? Well, those peaks, they who knows what those are? They're they're out of sight. Yeah, they are. But that is the huge starting current, isn't it? That's 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 the bit that I'm really concerned about or worried about. Whenever the tube switches on, it's got to pass through this pre-ionization phase every time it switches on. Okay, I use that phase and I can sustain it forever. This is two milliseconds per division. It's taken almost four milliseconds for it to get But in that steady. four milliseconds, some of the current spikes are somewhere over the rainbow. Literally. And, and, and I have to you be know, honest with talk, you. I'm talking about, you know, just what, that's my concern, what those huge current spikes are doing to the, to the carbon dioxide atoms. The, the energy in, that gets transferred to the nitrogen is so much that it's doing this damage, this dissociation. That's what. Well, it's it's. Well, first of all, let me make a couple of comments. And what I'm going to say is it's worse than you think it is because you can't see it. You really can't see how high it goes. I really can't see how high no. it goes. I mean, just okay. cause, just because the ammeter is only showing it at four milliamps, if I sustain that region, that doesn't tell you what the milliamps actually got. It's just no. a very average. At however, the very high speed. however, okay, in terms of energy. That's very, very short period of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I mean that's that's nanoseconds, nanoseconds. So the reality is, is it's probably not really hurting things. You don't think so? No, no. But for but such a short period of time, for a short period of time. Well, yeah, the average is like as it says, four milliamps. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's 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 it's, it's about nothing. Most of you, if you uh, I've seen your power supplies that have got two different ways to do the control. They've got an analog input that's typically a 0 to 5 volt, uh, and then they also have a PWM input. But I'm going to tell you what most of these power supplies are going to do is they're going to filter out the, the PWM and make it, you know, into like the 0 uh, over 5 volts. And you can, you can put some sort of filter uh, in there, and it can be as simple as a, an R, RC filter in there. And so basically your PWM is getting, it gets filtered back into a steady state, a, a steady state uh, which then the control loop goes here. So we've identified the mains frequencies could be in there, the switching frequency could be in there, that's 100 kilohertz, the loop's got a frequency that goes around there, and then the PWM's got a frequency. There's four different frequencies that could be running through all of this. Okay, so come around and look. Um, that's a 50 millisecond pulse. That's a 50, and you can see, I mean, it's roughly 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. It's about, it's about 50. Yeah, right? which 20 milliseconds is rubbish. This is like also 10 milliamps per it's vertical 12, division, yeah, yeah. so about 12. And so it's taken all that amount of time to stabilize, to stabilize out. Correct. 20 milliseconds. This one's taken 20, so mine was taken two. Yeah, even though my scopes, you know, way faster bandwidth than yours, it's still probably that's all too narrow to really 
You can. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, so even even if you were to stretch that out to its maximum, you wouldn't be able to see any of those peaks. You don't think. If I was to do it again, and you were so resampling, let's, let's, let's resample and put the level up there, so he you know he triggers somewhere around that that. Okay. Go give us another pulse. And this is 50% well into the stable region. Okay. Yeah. You can see these things are still incredibly uh, narrow. You look down at the bottom here, I mean, you can still see that there are there are spikes that are going up here, which are not these huge spikes. No, but now, but now remember that that power supply is trying to trying to make the current that you're telling it to do at yeah. fifty percent, and it's the power supply has got that response curve. It's trying to follow. Go go put it up. Go put it up at hundred percent. Really? Yeah. Okay. 10 milliseconds at 95 percent. And so you... It's gone a little bit faster, hasn't it? Because that's 10 milliseconds. So that's about three, two or three milliseconds, right. isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's headed on up there, right? It's like, you know, we've told it to go farther. But see the interesting thing here? Look at, look at the down. shape of that yeah. curve. Okay. See, it doesn't look like it's quite stable, stabilized out yet. So let's, let's, uh, let's see what it takes for that to stabilize. Make that pulse, make that pulse a, a 50 millisecond and let's see what he, what he does. Yeah. Okay. Huh. It never stabilized. It, it didn't stabilize <laughs> there, yeah. So that, but was, 90, that was a case but where... But that's 95% where the tube is being seriously overdriven. But remember, it, uh, the shape's not going to make any difference. Put it at 50% and it'll be lower, but it'll still be it just like that. Yeah. Well, it actually, it's, it's, it's lower, it's not, you know. It's, it's still there. It's still there. Okay, that's okay. 50%, 100 milliseconds. And, and that frequency is the loop response. It's, quite a it's the feedback loop. Yes, yeah. the feedback loop. Okay. Uh, that's 15, 20, 25, 30, which is the maximum you'd ever want to see on the tube. That still isn't, it's such a transitory voltage, uh, current you're saying, that it's not going to have any effect. Oh, I don't think we're seeing near the top of that. Uh -huh. No, you might not be seeing near the top, but it's such a short period. Correct. That's the, the, the energy Correct. in there not is not energy. enough to kick right. the, the nitrogen into high enough energy state to collide with the um, CO2. So it's not enough to cause to, the lacing yeah, action. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah. That, that's my major concern, Chip. I and mean, you know, thanks for putting my mind at rest because yeah, I don't think that's uh, you know, I don't think because I was very concerned that me using that range and <clears throat> let me put it onto that range now, which is 20%. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's just it just it's going. And it, that's a high impact region, which is presumably the start. It, the beam is never getting started. You know, and electrons are getting knocked loose, and so you are getting, you are getting some, damage, some nitrogen that's that's getting charged up, and it's going and doing it. I don't, I don't think you're getting damage. Because that that's my concern. I, yeah. I love that region to use for cutting card. That's 10 milliseconds. Well, let's do like a uh, like a 50 millisecond and five zero. Yeah, five zero. Mm -hmm. Fifty percent then or something. Okay. Or that'd be like 20,000 volts right there, and it's going on up uh, above that. Right. So it's stabilizing out at 20,000 volts. Yeah, and that's that's the that's the quote fixed voltage, right? Yeah. Okay, that the thing is, and quite frankly, if we went and if we put it at like 40%, we probably ought to see it the same voltage. Yeah. You know, the current will change, but the voltage ought to be the same. It ought to be the same. You know, or not. is that worth a chat? Just there. What you can see here is that we actually, um, I mean, let me put it on here, we went down from 15 you know, to about 12 milliamps, mm -hmm. okay? But you notice here, we've still got our 20,000 volts. See, the volts hadn't changed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's, that's, that's the essence of uh, a, a gas discharge tube. Now, to finish up with, there are one or two things that I must say about my visit to Florida. First of all, a sincere thanks to Chip Williams for his dissertation on power supplies. Now I've learned a great deal about the power supply itself and you've heard me testing him often 
as to the possible damage that high frequency impact engraving may have on our tubes. His opinion is very clear. The very, very transient nature of these spikes is such that they're unlikely to be damaging our tube. So I've got to thank him for putting my mind at rest on that one. You've heard me mention uh, at the beginning that I produced an all-in-one tube and mirror mount out of Perspex. Now I designed that specifically for Danny's machine while I was there, but prior to my going I produced a video about something that I was working with on my Think Laser machine. That will be the subject of the next video um, because that leads me into a third subject. Danny was most insistent that he wanted a beam combining system integrated into this one piece tube and mirror mount assembly. Now that's a subject all on its own which will be yet a further video. So all I can say to you as usual, thank you very much for watching and uh, there's one or two more interesting subjects to come up yet.